It's story time today on Bike Bike Nudge Nudge. In this episode, I will tell you the tale of the Victoria Promenade bike lanes. It's a tale of nimbyism's heroic struggle against no odds, and it supports the Brent Todarian quote, the truth about a city's aspirations isn't found in its vision, it's found in its budget. Or, in this case, its actions. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start at the beginning. Our story takes place here, beside the Victoria Promenade. The road where our bike lane is situated is now simply called 100th Avenue, but long, long ago it was called Victoria Ave. Car traffic ran in both directions and there was no such thing as bike infrastructure. Sometime between 1957 and 1965, Victoria Park Road was built going down the hill. This complicated the intersection at the east end of Victoria Promenade so the road was changed to a one-way heading east. The city then added a sharrow for westbound people on bikes and a contraflow painted bike gutter for people biking east. This bike infrastructure was possibly added to encourage people on bikes to stay off the strode one block to the north. I actually featured that strode in my previous video because I believe that is where proper, protected, safe biking infrastructure should exist. The city would take better care of this painted bike gutter than other painted bike gutters. From what I remember, snow was actually plowed onto the curb for the most part. Other painted bike gutters in the city tended to be used as snow storage lanes in the winter. But due to the curve of the road and the energy imparted by car tires, all the gravel and sand the city spread during the winter would end up in the bike lane. It would take one kindly man, we'll call him Chris, and his push broom to sweep up the painted bike gutter in the spring long before the city's street sweepers would come out. So, for decades, the painted bike infrastructure beside Victoria Promenade didn't change. But the philosophy of the city began to change. In 2009, the city began to talk about shifting transportation modes in its transportation master plan. In 2015, the city adopted Vision Zero. For those who don't know, Vision Zero is a strategy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries while increasing safe, healthy, and equitable mobility for all. Vision Zero is usually implemented through design changes. It accepts that people are fallible, so infrastructure design is the best way to reduce the severity of collisions. In 2019, the city declared a climate emergency. This policy change does impact transportation, but we'll come back to this image later and talk about the subtlety of the wording. 2019 also saw the next iteration of the master plan, the city reaffirmed that bike infrastructure must be safe. That brings us to 2020. During the first summer of the COVID pandemic, cities around the world opened up street space to people for walking, running, and biking. Victoria Promenade was expanded to include a mobility lane in the summers of 2020 and 2021. The city's Vision Zero Street Lab then started a project that eventually led to a protected bike lane being installed on each side of 100th Avenue. The lanes were installed on July 9th, 2022, and would be left in place until at least the spring of 2023, before any changes would be made. Well, that's what the plan claimed, at least. The fall evaluation report came out in December of 2022. From this report, it was decided on December 19th that the protected bike lane on the north side of 100th Avenue would be removed. Despite some very cold weather over the holidays, the bike lane was completely removed on December 30th just 11 days after the decision was made. This person couldn't wait for the lane to be removed and spent at least five days parked in the bike lane between the announcement and the removal. The city has an outstanding record of efficiency when it comes to removing non-car infrastructure from city streets, but the city still wasn't fast enough for this person. So why was the bike lane removed and how does its removal go against so many city policies? There were concerns from cyclists about the safety of the lanes. Well, Maybe not the safety of the lanes, but the safety of the connections to the lanes. As I showed in a previous video on the level of traffic stress, there was no bike infrastructure to the east, and the bike lanes to the west are substandard in any city that is seriously trying to improve biking. In fact, the city's own advice is to not ride on half the lane due to danger of being doored. Also, remember how I said earlier that the road going down the hill complicated the intersection of the east end of 100th Avenue for people and cars? The city solved this once and for all for the painted bike gutter and the protected bike lane by just ending them and saying good luck. Most people I know would just time their ride to cross the street through the gap in oncoming traffic. 
the city did designate the sidewalk on the north side as a shared use path. This is actually a common tactic in the city. If the city wants people on bikes off the road due to very unsafe conditions, or because it feels drivers may be annoyed by people on bikes, it just puts up a sign to declare the closest sidewalk a shared path. At least the sidewalk on 100th Avenue is a bit wider than normal, unlike this nearby sidewalk. So from what I happen to hear from the people I know who actually ride bikes, there was nothing wrong with the Victoria Promenade bike lanes, but there were issues with the connections. There were also concerns from people not on bikes. From one of the reports, it's all of the usual concerns. People walking said they feel less safe crossing two bike lanes and one car lane, with fewer and slower moving cars than if they were crossing one bike lane, one parking lane, and one car lane with more, faster moving cars. People were also concerned about the potential of hitting people on bikes with cars. Interesting that they seem to think that having a barrier between cars and bikes makes it more likely people on a bike will be hit. The bike lane also blocked the vision of drivers more than a row of parked cars, apparently. There were also concerns that the bike lane would lower property values. There were arguments that homelessness or the opioid crisis were getting less funding because of the bike lane. That certain city councillors were using their power to force the building of bike lanes. Or the respondent just doesn't like any bike lanes at all, anywhere, ever. The city's report also mentions five media reports on the bike lanes. I didn't read or watch the media reports, but the headlines all frame the bike lanes negatively. A more recent article on the removal of the bike lane made sure to use a photo with no bikes in the bike lane and the car lane congested with all of five cars. But in my opinion, the main concern, and the one I will talk about a bit more at length, is parking. The bike lane on the north side of 100th Avenue required the removal of 20 on-street free parking stalls. Unfortunately, I haven't seen any data on how those stalls were used. The building residents claim the parking was used by their friends coming for a visit, or the spots were used to load or unload vehicles with people who are elderly or disabled. These claims are simply appeals to emotion. First, it should be expected that parking will be limited in a dense urban environment. The city's own analysis showed that the 20 parking spots represent just 6.5% of all parking spots within a five minute walk of Victoria Promenade. It's not the city's responsibility to allocate public space solely for the free storage of private metal boxes, especially for a limited number of people in such a densely populated location. Second, by limiting free parking, the city reduces the number of people driving into the area from other parts of the city. This will provide a small reduction in traffic congestion and all its byproducts, like noise and air pollution. As Donald Shoup would tell you, if the promenade is really an attraction, people driving from far away would be willing to pay more for parking nearby or pay with their time to park further away and walk. And third, all the buildings along 100th Avenue have private parking for residents, have free public parking on nearby side streets, and some even have driveways for loading and unloading people and goods. Sure, losing the 20 parking spots might have made it a tiny bit harder to find parking, but finding parking would have been difficult before, and all the buildings have private alternatives. All the buildings except one. The only person in the world who has enough reason to be grumpy and he is really grumpy about it. About losing the street parking is the man who owns this building, the Animo Manor. We'll call him Uncle Bob because the owner of this building actually is my Uncle Bob. He's a wonderful gentleman who I greatly admire and respect. The Animo was built in 1914, a time when there were very few cars in the city. As was typical for the time, the building was built right to the property lines. There is no private parking. My uncle does have a slightly harder time renting apartments because there's no on-site private parking. However, removing all parking along 100th Ave should barely affect that. There are 25 units in the building. There are just three spots directly in front of the building and just 20 spots removed for the entire bike lane. So there aren't even enough parking spots along all of 100th Ave for each unit in the Animo. Over the long term, having parking or no parking on 100th Ave would have little effect on the Animo or Uncle Bob. It is plain to see for anyone moving into the Animo that there is no reserved parking for residents. The only issue I see is the loss of temporary space for loading and unloading. This is likely a growing problem for residents of the Animo as home delivery grows in popularity. It is not a new problem as parking was always scarce but the problem got worse for the Animo with no parking or loading zones for the building. Unless you're willing to risk a ticket by briefly parking in front of this fire hydrant. Again, Every other building kept the loading zones beside or behind the building. 
two buildings to the east of the Animo, the Fairmont, even kept the loading zone in front of the building. But the loss of these 20 parking spots was likely the biggest complaint and probably what killed the bike lane on the north side of the road. Let's now take a quick look at how removing the bike lane aligns with city policy. At first I thought removing the bike lane contradicted the city's master plan and transportation plan. The mobility pyramid I showed earlier seems to prioritize walking, then biking, then transit, and finally driving. I'm sure I've read other city plans where this actually is the case. I have an academic paper about how cities frame their plans, so I've read quite a few policy documents from cities. My city frames active transportation as a choice, for some, if they really have to, I guess. The text above the pyramid supports this. Try to choose. Going over the city's own documents again reminded me of the framing the city uses in its planning documents. The city almost always suggests that people can try to use alternative transportation, but there's very little the city has committed to do to encourage alternative transportation. In fact, in the last election, nearly all of the white, male, boomer, car culture candidates were defeated in favor of candidates promising to lead the city towards more alternative transportation, environmental responsibility, and better overall urbanism. Then, in the latest four-year budget plan, the city administration presented a budget to these councillors with zero dollars for active transportation. Brent Todarian was right. The truth is in the budget. The next city policy is its commitment to Vision Zero. The city's technical analysis showed that driver behavior improved, biking speeds were lowered, many people, as in 300 to 500 per day, used the bike lane, and there were fewer people riding bikes on the sidewalk. All of these should make any Vision Zero advocate happy. Yet, the bike lane on the north side of the road was removed and replaced with a sharrow. Academic research has shown that sharrows are less safe for people on bikes than nothing at all. Now, the only thing keeping people riding bikes westbound safe are speed limit signs. I guess that's to be expected in a city that thinks this ad is enough to keep people safe and conforms to Vision Zero philosophy. Also, speed limit signs don't work in this city. People speed so much and get so angry about being caught that the city dresses up photo radar trucks like this so only the truly stupid or inattentive will ever get a speeding ticket. Painting photo radar trucks like this can only be done by a city that doesn't understand or doesn't really care about Vision Zero. A city that was actually trying to achieve Vision Zero wouldn't need photo radar because roads would be designed so that driving faster than the desired speed would feel uncomfortable or dangerous to the driver. Finally, what about the city declaring an environmental emergency? Removing the bike lane goes against that. 100th Ave will now feel less safe for people on bikes, which will nudge some people to drive more. More parking also nudges people to drive more. Any city that thinks there's an environmental emergency occurring should not be encouraging more driving. But what do I know? I only have a PhD in urban planning that focuses on mobility and carbon pricing, a nudge to, amongst other things, reduce driving in order to mitigate the climate crisis. So it looked like installing protected bike lanes on Victoria Promenade aligned with the city's policies. Removing the protected bike lane on the north side of the road went against city policies. The bike lanes were even accomplishing everything that they were supposed to do, yet the city caved to car culture complaints. To me, the people complaining about the bike lanes sound like the members of the People's Front of Judea. All right, all right, all right. But besides reducing car traffic, reducing driving speeds, keeping people safe on bikes, and reducing the number of people biking on the sidewalk, what have the bike lanes ever done for us? That's my look at the Victoria Promenade Protected Bike Lane. For those who used any version of the bike lanes, please let me know if I've been unfairly critical. Some of what I said is my own experience or opinion, but the vast majority was based on city documents I read. For those who haven't used the bike lanes, I hope I've shown that Brent Todarian is correct. If you're advocating for safe, protected bike lanes in your city, your job isn't done just because your city has made a few proclamations. In fact, your job isn't done even once the lanes are installed. Advocacy needs to continue so that the safety of people outside of cars isn't sacrificed and the environment isn't harmed just so 20 people can store their private metal box in public space. I hope my city councillors will see this video and ask themselves why they make bold proclamations, but city administration does the opposite. Thanks for watching and I look forward to your comments. Let's hope winter where I live ends a little early so this cargo bike focused channel can once again have some videos about cargo bikes. I've been filling time with general urban planning rants because I haven't wanted to take my new cargo bike out in the snow and cold and mud. Please consider subscribing if you want to see all the cargo bike errands I have planned for the summer.